Hello. Welcome to the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture Artist Talk featuring Matthew Hintzman. I'm Sarah Rodrigo, Public Art Project Manager for the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture. Joining me tonight are Christina Carroll, our Communications Director, and Trisha Gilrain, the Art Collections Manager, along with, of course, Matthew, the artist. We're very excited to hear Matthew talk about his past work and his design for a new public artwork at the Jamaica Plain BPL and Curtis Hall BCYF campus. But first, I'd like to give you a short introduction to the City of Boston's public art program and the process that brought us here tonight. The Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture enhances the quality of life, the economy, and the design of the city through the arts, including public art. Arts and Culture houses the Boston Art Commission, also known as the BAC, an independent commission that commissions, approves, and conserves all public art cited on city property. The BAC is guided by their curatorial mission, which you can see here. They commission and approve innovative and transformative artworks that engage communities, enrich and enliven the urban environment, are driven by a clear artistic vision, enhance the diversity of the existing collection, respond directly to a specific environment, and possess durability appropriate to the lifespan of the work. Under the leadership of Mayor Walsh and through the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, the city released its first cultural plan, Boston Creates, in 2016. The plan called for more support for Boston arts and Boston's arts and culture ecosystem and identified five specific goals. To create fertile ground for the arts, keep artists in Boston and attract new ones, cultivate equity and access, integrate arts and culture into all aspects of civic life, and mobilize likely and unlikely partners. In order to fund commissions for public art, the city created the Percent for Art program the Percent for Art program is a critical part of the planning process and addresses goal four of the plan, to integrate arts and culture into all aspects of civic life, inspiring all Bostonians to value, practice, and reap the benefits of creativity in their individual lives and in their communities. The Percent program sets aside 1% of the city's annual capital budget for public art. At this time, we have 18 active percent funded projects in various levels of development. Our first completed installation of new city funded public art was in September 2019, the North Square Stories by A&J Art and Design in the North End neighborhood. I encourage you all to visit it using appropriate social distancing. The commissioning process for the Jamaica Plain BPL Curtis Hall BCYF campus artwork began with public meetings hosted by MOAC in partnership with the BPL and other city agencies to talk about what the neighborhood would like to see in an artwork. Those meetings generated a tremendous amount of content, some of which you can see here. A favorite phrase shared was, keep JP weird. The city incorporated the community's desires into a call to artists. Matthew Hinsman's proposal was selected by an artist selection committee made up of arts professionals, many from the JP neighborhood, and the BAC commissioned him for the project. Matthew is a sculptor and educator living in Jamaica Plain, a professor of sculpture at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design, and the chair of MassArt's Fine Arts 3D program. Since being commissioned, Matthew has worked with a community advisory committee, hosted public meetings, and presented his preliminary design and his final design to the BAC at public meetings. Tonight, he'll be talking about his past work and his final design, which was approved by the BAC in March of this year. Here you can see I'm hosting some meetings. One last note before I turn this over to Matthew. After his talk, we will open the floor to questions. You can ask questions or make comments on the Facebook page, or you can send an email to me at sarah.rodrigo at boston.gov. That's S-A-R-A-H dot R-O-D-R-I-G-O at boston.gov. I'll read the questions to Matthew after his talk. Uh, Matthew, welcome. I'm going to hand over the presenting mode to you. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and I want to thank the Boston Art Commission for their support over the past few years as I've developed this project. Um, and I want to thank all of you for being here tonight, too. Um, you know, I'd rather give this talk in person as I have in the past, but I'm glad that we had this opportunity for me to share the design and for you to ask questions and get involved. 
And as great as that is, uh, I don't want to minimize or gloss over the fact that we're still in the midst of a pandemic. I hope all of you are safe and secure with your families and loved ones. I'm thankful we can share this moment uh, and then I can share my art with you. But I'd like to take a quick moment of silence to just send our thoughts, prayers, and thanks out to all those who are continue, continuing to go to work every day, those essential workers, be they in healthcare or the grocery stores, the bus drivers and the de delivery folks. So I just wanna say a thank you to all of them for their work. And so thank you so much. Um, and some other folks that I just want to congratulate actually recently named um, new fellows of the Boston Air Program. Uh, this is their fifth, fourth cohort of artists. Uh, yep, uh, looking for confirmation there. And uh, I just want to name them off. I think it's so exciting. There's uh, uh, Anthony Romero, Pat Falco, Aaron Genia, Victor Yang, and Golden. And I can't wait to see the projects that you're going to come up with. So congratulations and uh, good luck with your work. Um, and finally, um, I'd just like to thank my family, Elena, my wife, and my kids, Sienna and Azure, who are uh, downstairs tuning in on their computer from the first floor. So with that, I'm going to share my presentation and uh, talk to you all. Here we go. It's just a few clicks away. Here we go. So I was given this commission. Uh, and um, what's really great about this uh, Percent for Art program is how it's giving artists a lot of time to spend time with the uh, locations, with the sites, to really look at what's going on and figure out how they want to interact with the site. So this is the site in front of the uh, re renovated Boston Public Library branch in Jamaica Plain, and, um, and also in front of Curtis Hall. So what I started to think about when I'm looking at this site as I started to think about the lawn as sort of a pretty major place to maybe do something. Uh, it's like kind of the site where people go or people have the opportunity to go. I, as a community center and the library, I think of them as foundational places within our community. So I like the idea of the foundation as a place, as a word. Um, and I'm also really interested in a library as a place of discovery. I worked in a library when I was in uh, high school, the Reading Public Library in Reading, Massachusetts. And, uh, you know, I put away books in the stacks. That's primarily what I did. And I just love putting things away and finding things adjacent to the stuff that I was putting away and thinking, this is just so much information here. And even when I went to the card catalogs, I'd find, you know, cool things next to the book I was looking for. And then there's a materiality to the site. Um, that I'm really interested in. And in my own artwork, I'm very interested in the disruption of the familiar and embracing uncertainty and ambiguity. Maybe that's the keeping JP weird part of it all. So I'm gonna, let's look at the lawn for a second. So this lawn out in front of Curtis Hall, um, it's about 175 feet long in front of uh, South Street there. And it's about 50 feet deep at the top of the oval, if you will. There's a sort of simplified view of it. One of the major um, attributes of the lawn, as far as I can see, is uh, there's this iron fence that goes all along South Street that prevents uh, folks from coming directly into the lawn off of that sidewalk. You can see it down here too, from Curtis Hall looking down to South Street, you see that iron fence all across the front. So what happens is when folks try to enter into the site, they're always entering by the driveways on either side of the oval. And that means the foot traffic, if they're going into Curtis Hall or the library, um, they pretty much avoid the lawn altogether. And although people do jump into the lawn to hang out and there's yard sales there and stuff, for the most part, folks who use the campus avoid the lawn. This is, of course, the um, Copley branch, the main branch of the Boston Public Library. And as a foundation of knowledge, it's the one first public libraries in the country. Um, and I, I love this book that I found in Boomerangs here in JP just before I was giving an original presentation, The New Book of Knowledge. And what is interesting about this is, of course, this new book of knowledge was printed in the 1970s, so now it's actually an old book of knowledge. And that this library, this repository of this knowledge and this book, it's really, um, it's a never-ending quest, and we're always changing our ideals and what we think we know and what we don't know. And that idea of a foundation, foundational, it's meant to be about strength, but it's also shifting under us all the time. These, this is just an image of like a foundation out in the woods. And when I was a kid living on the North Shore, um, we'd play out in the woods near our house and there were these old foundations. And it was so amazing to me thinking about what was there before as these things slowly receded back into the earth. 
But then we also lived near new developments and there were these brand new foundations. And so these foundations were pointing towards the future. What was moving, what was coming up out of the earth? What was growing? So I like the idea that this, that a foundation can actually point in both directions in terms of time. It can point to the past and it can turn point to the future. Um, as I mentioned in my initial sort of structure of how I was looking at the site, the library for me is a real site of discovery. You know, when, you know, I learned how to look for stuff in the library by flipping through the card catalog and you'd find things, even in the card catalog, you'd find an interesting book, you're like that's the book that I'm looking for. And then you'd find stuff adjacent to it in the card catalog. So I should find that. And then as you went down into the stacks to find your book, you'd always find something a couple shelves away. There was actually something maybe you needed to find um, more than the book you were looking for. And uh, one of the, um, one of the authors that I think is really fantastic, Douglas Adams, who wrote The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, he also wrote Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. And the main character, Dirk Gently, he says this uh, in the course of uh, sort of following this random woman. Uh, and he gets into a car accident. And she's like, what are you doing? Why are you following me? And he says, well, my own strategy is to find a car or the nearest equivalent, which looks as if it knows where it's going and follow it. I rarely end up where I was intending to go, but often end up somewhere that I needed to be. And I love that about libraries in terms of what they, the, the potential of the, the knowledge or the information stored there, that we go in looking for one thing, but we find something actually ancillary, something next to it that's actually more important. Okay. So materiality. So the site is really beautiful site. Uh, this is this amazing new uh, design by Util Design uh, that has this great reading room at the front of the library. It's really bright and open and airy. Um, and then it's connected with a series of really interesting brickwork back to the original building. There's also Curtis Hall, which is next door, which is from the 19th century. It's also a really beautiful building with great details. Um, most of those details I would look at in terms of the brickwork. So on the lower left-hand side of your screen, you see this darker brick, and it looks like the smaller sections of brick are poking out. This is called the Flemish bond pattern that Util replicated from the library, which is on the right, lower right-hand side of your um, screen. And I just really like that attention to details, the physicality of it, the tactile nature of it. So as I first started to think about the site, I was drawing these weird little wall nuggets. I don't know what else to call them, but they're like these little sculptural objects made out of bricks. Uh, I was thinking about glazed bricks, maybe to bring some color into the site that were topped with some sort of like Quincy granite. Um, and, you know, it's not unlike some other work that I've done. This is a replica of an old school bent wooden lobster trap that I replicated in handmade uh, bricks. Um, you know, and what's interesting about this and a lot of the work that I do is how important the material is in translating information and meaning to the viewer. So even though this has been shown outside, but it's also been shown in gallery spaces, I've watched folks come up to this object in a gallery and then sort of look around, make sure no one's looking and kick the object. And they would do so to, again, to make sure, is this thing real? Is it real? And of course it is real and they'll probably break their toe if they kick it. Um, but I always find it interesting, people want to interact with them because of the reality and the literalness of some of the material choices that I'm using. Another project, that I uh, completed when I was at the University of California, San Diego as a graduate student, was I did a, a sculptural intervention with the little gray posts, which are called bollards, that dot the entire campus. The bollards, usually they're set up in threes, there's one behind that little electric truck you see on that picture. And um, the bollards, they delineate the space between vehicular traffic and pedestrian traffic. And I was just really interested in thinking about ways to sort of, you know, I don't know, just an intervention. How do I activate these objects that people that are actually put into the space, they're meant to be seen so you don't drive into them, but at the same time, they're meant to sort of just blend into the background. You don't know they're there. So what I did was I replicated uh, these sculptures called Greek, Greek Herms. Uh, there's a couple at the MFA, you can go see them, behind that copper fig leaf, and there's a long story to that fig leaf, which I did not create, but there's uh, an erect phallus. And this is just an exact replica, again, of the Greek Herm. Um, and what was awesome about this is that one of my colleagues in school said he saw someone walk by and sort of wrap their knuckles on the top of the object and it's made out of forged welded and fabricated steel so again there's a sort of reality around the object that sort of takes somebody from surprise like oh this isn't a joke this is real this is like a sanctioned thing it's made out of real stuff um and finally this is the um this is called the act and bench and um this was 
This was actually uh, made as a part of an outdoor exhibition at the Acton Boxborough Arboretum. Um, and one of the curators, Nick Capasso, who's a dear friend, he's been a great supporter um, and mentor of mine. He curated, he along with some other folks, curated that exhibition. And what, after I installed the piece and at the opening, he said to me, you know, Matt, we almost didn't, we almost didn't select your sculpture because we weren't sure you would make it well enough for people to sit on it. And I thought that was really interesting. You know, a sculptor makes things that are representations of things, but not necessarily things that function as furniture objects. So uh, I'm glad he did. And I, he's glad that he did. And the rest of the crew uh, curate the piece into the show and you can sit in it and look at nature in this space. But I thought that's interesting about what's expected of art and what's not expected of art. If it was art, it's not expected to have that kind of physical reality. This is uh, the Jamaica Pond Bench and sort of a, I think a really good example of how I use materiality and a certain sense of uncertainty and ambiguity in the work. Um, I've also seen people come up to this object and kind of push on it like they're gonna, they expect it to fall over or, or blow away in the wind like it's a figment of their imagination. Um, and I just like the fact that folks can bring their own story to it like was this a mistake? Did someone do this on purpose? Uh, in fact, last night, apparently, uh, there was a feature on the bench that was taped a number of years ago, but it was on Chronicle New England last night, and a few people emailed me that they had just seen it. So that's kind of exciting that that happened yesterday. Um, one of my favorite artists, Kiki Smith, she is a uh, she's an amazing sculptor and has work at the Stewart Art Collection at UC San Diego. And she has this quote about that particular collection, and she says, it's really important to have things that are inexplicable physically in your daily life. And I really appreciate that so much of the built environment is designed around telling us what to do, how to be safe, how not to get hurt, uh, how to be orderly. And there's room in my mind in the public sphere for things to be a little more ambiguous, to be a little messier, to, to provoke wonder and imagination. So with that, here's the plan. I'm gonna have a sip of water here. Okay. Here's the lawn. The first thing that I want to do, I talked about the entrance to the lawn and how the lawn itself isn't activated because of the foot traffic and how it moves through the space. So what I want to do is right in the center there on South Street, I want to open up a gate uh, off the sidewalk so that folks can enter into the lawn from South Street. This will also allow folks who are waiting for the bus to actually sit on the lawn and as the bus comes, they could run out to get the bus where, where currently they can't because they'd have to run all the way around that iron fence and they wouldn't make it there in time. So you can see folks can really access the site in a different way. And next, looking at, again, the materiality of the site. I mentioned the brickwork and all the um, different textures on the site. So I'm thinking about using, I am gonna use brickwork to make some forms like low stone walls, like low foundation walls within the space that people will also be able to sit on, all right? So they'll be mapped out onto the lawn, kind of like that. Um, and they'll be slightly terraced behind. It's a very slow slope from the top of the oval near Curtis Hall down to South Street, but they'll be backfilled a little bit. So the lawn will be a little bit flatter. They'll also afford folks to sit on the walls as, so there'll be a lot more seating in that area. Um, it should really, I think it'll help provide a better space for the flea markets where people will be able to use them as ways to, places to set up. Um, so I think that'll work out really great. Second thing is in a lot of my work, like the Jamaica Pond bench, uh, or the Acton Boxborough bench, um, is, uh, seating and thinking about, uh, everyday, um, objects and how they might be brought into a site. So I sort of landed on this idea of the most ubiquitous, commonplace, you don't even notice folding chair made out of bent aluminum with these vinyl uh, strapping and plastic arms. And so what I'd like to do and what I've begun to do is uh, cast a series of these in bronze. So we've already begun that process actually to make sure it was gonna work and figure out how we we're gonna do it and how much it was gonna cost. And so I have some shots from Sincere Metalworks. Um, they're up in Amesbury, they're doing this work for me. Um, they're great colleagues and makers. They produce the um, Boston Marathon Memorial. They're just amazing artists and uh, technicians and craftspeople that you'd ever meet. Um, and so you can see here, like this is a, a wax and you can see the amazing detail of the um, vinyl webbing and it goes all the way around the back of an object. And there's one of the whole seats. 
And then here are some of the bronze pieces. It's not put together yet, but here are some of the bronze pieces getting put together right now. It's going to be a pretty exquisite grouping of objects. So the idea is to take these bronze chairs and to set them up in arrangements on the lawn uh, for people to sit. So let's see, here's our lawn. Here are the walls that will intersect the site. Here's some chairs, a couple different locations for them. So if you were sitting in front of the JP library, there's a little bench out there, um, and looking towards the lawn, this is your current view. And then here's what you'll see when the installation is complete. There'll be the set of chairs. There may or may not be a um, light there. We're still working on that one. But uh, there'll be a, three seats there. There'll be the walls and then some seats in the distance. There's a little blow up of what that might look like. Then if we look from the new entrance off of South Street, this is what it currently looks like. And that's what it will look like there. So you see there would be this wall. It would be like 20 inches high, probably at the front, and then taper down to about six or seven inches where it hits the curb closest to the library. And then if you're looking from the other side back towards the library, this is the current view at about center, that flagpole's in the center. The flagpole is going to be moved to another location on the lawn. That's what it looks like now. And this is what it will look like. So that's the basic plan. Um, the title of the piece is called, um, it's called Wife and Web. You could also say With and Web. And a wife or a with in relationship to wall building is a single section or single depth of brick. That's called the width or wife. And um, the webbing refers to the webbing on the chairs. What I love about the uh, masonry term wife or width is this idea that um, it's actually joining together. Walls, and we've thought and heard a lot about walls as dividing de devices to divide people, but there's actually language within wall building that's, that's about bringing things together. It's actually related to weaving uh, more than any other word, the wall and the wife. And then the these simple chairs that are woven together um, as a web to bring people together, six feet apart, please, um, to uh, to build community. So I like the idea that this space is really can be an active space, a much more active space than it is now, um, and can be a haven for folks to hang out. Uh, all of the trees are being preserved. There's amazing shade there in the summertime. It's a beautiful sunny spot, but then it gets pretty hot. And so there's going to be shade spaces for people to hang out underneath the, those trees. Um, and just to be a really great place to hang out and wonder about what these things are. So um, if there are any questions, oh, I guess I can move it forward to that. Thank you and questions. Um, I'm going to, I guess I'll just stop sharing my screen right now because I don't need to do that. And I'm going to end the show. Hello, I'm back. Hi. Matthew, thank you so much. Sure, thank you. So just to remind people they can question on the Facebook page. Um, we'll be checking there. And they can also email my email address, sarah.rodrigo at boston.gov. <laughs> I have a small assistant here. Um, we do have a couple questions. Uh, the first one is, why did you decide to apply for this project? Oh, that's a good question. Well, <laughs> uh, I've been making and installing public art in Jamaica Plain for a long time. Uh, it, it, it hasn't been a, with permission, though. What I mean by that is I've been doing guerrilla installations in Jamaica Plain for a very long time. When I first installed the Jamaica Pond Bench, well, I didn't ask permission. I did get permission um, by the Boston Art Commission. And there's been a couple other projects, you know, so I really think of myself as a local artist. I love building and making artworks for my community. Um, and I've been really heartened by the folks who... Um, reach out to me and say that they've seen my work, the big, well, big, Jamaica Pond Bench isn't that big, but the big stuff, the little stuff, and that, you know, they're really, it, it, it means something to them in their local neighborhood. So when this opportunity came up, I was like, I have to apply to this. And, and you know, again, I worked in the public library when I was a kid and um, 
And so between Jamaica Plain and the public library, I really felt like I had to apply. Yeah. So. I have to say the bench is maybe not physically big, but very big in impact. Yeah. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's big. And amazing. It's been there for off and on for 14 years. Wow. And it's been there for nine years straight. Officially. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it's been well 14 years straight, actually. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, it's kind of amazing. So. Great. Um, so the next question, um, and this is really uh, sort of temporal in that, how has COVID-19 impacted you as an artist? And hold on a second, it's a little bit cut off here. And how has it impacted this project? Yeah, well, so Actually, so I went before, the last time I've been seen in public was March 10th, 2020, when I presented to the Boston Art Commission the final project, and they approved it. Right. So at that point in time, I had been traveling in Europe, actually, up until March 3rd. So it was kind of a crazy time, you know, and here getting scarier by the day. I was like, maybe I should go home a day early. Anyway, um, so at present, the, the project itself, um, hasn't changed, I would say. Um, the project itself hasn't changed because of COVID, except for perhaps potentially the timing, uh, which remains to be seen. You know, I think we're on track, uh, but, you know, you never know. Uh, my ability to do certain things, I, ha I haven't been able to attend a few meetings about the project, but the project itself has, has continued to move forward. In terms of my artistic practice, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a teacher, I'm a professor at MassArt, and um, the chair of my department of all this um, hands-on, in-studio shop experience. And we had to, my faculty had to transition to all, you know, distance remote learning. And so helping support that effort and planning for the next year. So the way COVID-19 has changed my artistic practice is it's basically, it's on hold, <laughs> you know, until such time as I can, uh, you know, and it's, that things settle down a little bit. There's so much that we're doing supporting our students at school um, who are really have faced, you know, this, this challenge, you know, and it's been really difficult for all of them who were, you know, so excited about working in the studios and the shops and with each other and with their faculty. And now it's all through this little green dot and, and the Brady Bunch squares on the screen. So, um, you know, and I do think of my artistic practice and my teaching practice as intertwined. And it's been super difficult for me to acclimate to to interacting just through this interface. So that's been hard. And I know that's hard for just that, you know, throw a dart and you'll hit somebody who would say the same thing. So um, I think that's a, how I'm feeling about that. I mean, I, I know it will impact me a lot as I come out of this and feel like I have the headspace to sort of uh, to tend to it. So. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so we have a question from Karen Pepperly, which is, are you moving the bike kiosk? <laughs> good question, Karen. That's a really good question, Karen. We're working on it. We're working. <laughs> we are. We've, we've been exploring some different options for that. Um, and we've been in different conversations. So that's still a, a TBD, I would say. Yeah. I mean, I, and I would say that, you know, the bike, the, that location at the monument is a hub. You know, it's sort of a hub in JP. Uh, a bunch of bus lines converge there before some go down Center Street and some go down South Street before you get to Forest Hills. Uh, there's the community center. There's Curtis, you know, Curtis Hall and the library. There's the Unitarian Church and uh, Kids Arts is located there and Elliott School and the Footlight Club and Bourne and Greenhill House. So there's a lot of cultural stuff happening there and it makes good sense to have the blue bikes in the area. Um, but a lot of folks are like, maybe we could move it. You know, is there another better space we could find um, for it? Because it's even, you know, it's just not an ideal location for the lawn. I think even for the bikes, you know, in the per in that vicinity, perfect. But that's not a it's not the perfect spot. So we're still looking. Yeah. And Melanie Grandy asks, um, how do you think the bronze will age, and will it be hot? Good question. Yeah. We've talked quite a bit about that. The folks at Sincere Metalworks made uh, Myrtle the Turtle, who was also uh, implicated in some uh, scorched hands in earlier in the year uh, on Beacon Hill. Uh, so the the chairs will be mounted to foundations, steel rods that go down into the earth, and the grass will be right up underneath them. 
Um, we're actually looking at putting some paver material uh, around certain areas where the chairs are so that folks, it's more uh, easily accessible with, with folks who have um, impaired mobility. Um, and, but there won't be any concrete or tar or pavement underneath it that would, that's reflecting heat back into the bronze objects. They're also up on the ground. They're, they're existing on site. There are these steel painted black um, benches. And, and even in the hottest day, those painted black steel benches don't get too hot to sit on. So, you know, they probably will get warm, but other uh, bronze chairs of this like with the same thickness that aren't enclosed forms that will really trap the heat. Like there's one down in uh, Falmouth that I think it's called the Seven Sisters Bookstore, I think. And they have this beautiful bronze chair that a local artist made. I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but it's really beautiful with all this alphabet and it's the same thickness bronze. And I don't think they've ever had many issues in the hot summer sun that that chair gets. So, um, and also they'll, they'll probably be in the shade for a part of the day too under the trees. So it will age beautifully, I think, with people sitting on the chairs. I think it'll really highlight the texture of the um, of the vinyl webbing. And I think it'll be, the chairs will be really curious objects. I think people will think, why are all these chairs out here? And then they'll realize they can't move them and they're bronze. And I think there'll be some interesting cognitive dissonance about how permanent this object is that shouldn't be so permanent. Agreed. And I think there's also a bronze bench in Faneuil Hall area. I, I'm blanking on the name. It's a There's a figure. Red well, yes. Red Alabac is down there, yeah. Yeah, and that bench is bronze. Yep. Um, so again, it's that uh, thickness of the material. Um, Noel from Curtis Hall, hello. Hey. Uh, <laughs> he asked if there's a time frame to start. Yeah, again. <laughs> Right now, we're in a pause of construction yeah. in general. Yeah, um, I mean, but, it, you know, Noel, the last we spoke was at the JPCC meeting, and I really, you know, heard your um, concerns about summertime programming and how that might be impacted. So some of our um, some of our vendors actually are a ways out on producing some of the material, the bricks. Um, I can show you one of the bricks. Oh, here it is. So here's one of these beautiful glazed bricks. It has these awesome rounded corners on the top. They're really beautiful. So they take like close to half a year to make. So we did order them already um, back in early March, but they won't be here till late summer. So I don't imagine we're gonna break ground until late summer. That And that has nothing to do with the current shutdown. So I don't. we'll see where we are later in the summer, but that would be the earliest. Right, that was your, um, your last schedule that you presented before yep. the shutdown. Yep. All right, so... Um, Christine McDermott Arena wants to know who this is. This is Casey, my son. So Hi. he's participating now. Um, uh, Eve Griffin had a question, but it looks like we have answered it uh, already. Okay. Which is hello, Eve, as well. Um, I have another question for you, which is what, what do you hope the public gets out of this piece and how do you want them to react to and interact with it? And you, you spoke a little bit about that already, but if you could expand on it. Yeah. You know, one of the things as a, as a professor of art, right. One of the things that I hope of my students is that they make works of art that I could never imagine. Right. So I think it's really funny to think about that. Like, how the heck can you do that? You know, it's I'm, I'm not teaching them a particular skill set. I mean, I do teach them skills like how to weld. Right. And, and I know how to weld. And so I teach them how to weld and they can do it. And it's sort of uh, clear. Um, but when you how do you encourage them? How do you nurture them to do something that you could never do or think of? And um, I think it's just giving them the time and the space and uh, the opportunity to look carefully at the things that they're making or the things around them. And so in terms of this work, what I hope it does is I hope it actually is a place of wonder and that people will make up narratives and stories and things to do in it that I couldn't think of, you know? Um, I really, you know, the, the Stuart Art Collection uh, had a really big impact on me uh, in my time at UC San Diego. Uh, Mary Beebe is the director there. She's an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary curator and, you know, she's been a director there forever. When the first sculpture that they put up there, Nikki de Saint Falls, Sun God, 
And uh, right away after the first year, students started decorating it and they have the Sun God Festival and the collection embraced it. You know, there's now this giant uh, Tim Hawkinson teddy bear piece on campus that weighs like 250 tons of rock. It's just the most ridiculous thing. Students put Santa hats on it and Mardi Gras beads on it. And so the, and, and it's encouraged. So the idea that, that folks could actually be a part of this and actually engage with it, that's why there's no pedestals, right? I don't like mm -hmm. that. I mean, I like pedestals for certain works, but for my work, I want my work to be in the space with the rest of us. And I want folks to be in those chairs, to be standing on those walls, to be making stuff up. Like it becomes a theater, it becomes a fort, it becomes, I don't know. So that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Liz Pinkman Butler says, Great job, Matthew. I can't wait to see this in person when it's done. And Thank Liz you. also says, Evan would like to know what you hope to see when you walk by on a summer day. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. I hope to see folks like standing and jumping and picnicking and hanging out on that in that space, which I don't see so much nowadays, you know. Uh, well, I don't see it at all nowadays, but um, in the past, I haven't seen it either. But yeah, I hope I hope to really see people in that space and utilizing that space in a way that none of us can imagine even today. That, um, yeah, it is hard to imagine uh, today what it will look like uh, <laughs> <It is. laughs> when it's in a little bit, yeah. but something to really look forward to is interacting with this piece, you know? Yeah. Um, I think, let's see, another question. What's your favorite thing about the design? Do you have a favorite thing? That's like asking about a favorite child, is it? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, hmm, my favorite thing about the design. I mean, I'm super excited about the chairs. You know, I mean, and the walls, too. I think they're going to be really quirky, you know. I'm, they're going to be things I've never seen before. So I'm really excited about that. I'm excited to see the walls kind, you know, to see if the walls will really feel like um, they're embedded in the earth, you know, and that they go down deep, that they were here longer, even though they're going to look new, but that they have this life of their own in a way, that they're going to uh, carry some caricature of a previous use maybe or a future use um I'm, so i'm curious to see that uh you know maybe when it's done i can i'll be able to answer that question better um you know there's a path that will go from south street up to the top of the oval sorted by the top of the oval that isn't shown in this drawing uh, but i'm excited to see how that really affects the space um so yeah so i don't know what my favorite thing is yet i'm i'm super excited to see it realized <laughs> yeah it's well, and I wonder too if it'll change over time yeah if your favorite thing yeah. will be different uh, a year after you've yeah. installed it right or different times of the year it might change or something yeah. yeah it's true I was very um I forget how leafy mm -hmm. <laughs> that's like yeah. it is yeah. coming out of the winter that's right how many yeah. trees there are and um, how green it can be mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions? I am checking right now. We've talked about the bike kiosk. I think that is all the, the questions from the audience. Cool. Yeah. It's really exciting, Matthew. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I'm sure we'll do more presentations and have more conversations. And Absolutely. I hope everyone enjoyed this. And um, I welcome follow-up questions from anyone who's watching. I think um, we'll be, this will be available after tonight. Okay. I'm not, that's Christina's mm -hmm. uh area but yeah. i believe this will still be available on on facebook to be replayed so um so we can direct people here and more people can get excited about with and web and seeing it come to fruition hopefully sometime soonish
Great. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you all uh, who showed up today for uh, coming and supporting the work. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Sarah. Have a great night. Thank you. You okay. too. All right. Bye.